Hello everyone. So I think we'll just start the webinar right now. Uh, so welcome, welcome, welcome to this um, to our first uh, debut for this entrepreneurship series webinar. So we are hosting this uh, with some of our, our team members as well, some of our moderators. And I'll introduce myself. So my name is uh, Ardian Skamdani. I'm currently in undergrad at Babson College, and I'm the director of events. And here I'm also with uh, some of my amazing moderators as well. Uh, there's Cherise, uh, there's also uh, Bimo, there's also Vanya, and they're from UC Berkeley, uh, Northeastern, and from UCLA. And for our speakers, um, so we can welcome maybe uh, Stephen and also Anderson. So both of these um, amazing gentlemen are uh, alumni from uh, Y Combinator and they have established an amazing startup that are now starting to um, develop over the years. And maybe they can tell the story later um, when they talk more about uh, um, during, during the session, during the talk. And maybe we can jump uh, into Bimo. Bimo, can you introduce um, Steven right now? Hello everyone, uh, my name is Bimo and I'll be the moderator for Steven. Uh, nice to meet you, Steven. Uh, I'd like to wel welcome you again uh, to Permias Entrepreneurship Series. Uh, before we start the questions, I would like to give a small introduction about Steven to everyone. Steven Hi. is the CEO and co-founder of Nusantara Technology and one of his integral projects is Aplikasi Super, the first Indonesian consumer technology company to be accepted uh, to the Y Combinator program. Jadi aplikasi super ini merupakan aplikasi yang fokus untuk memberi fasilitasi dan distribusi produk-produk SME, small medium enterprises, mostly small kiosks uh, to consumers efficiently. Uh, the application has been rolled out to numerous small kiosks in Eastern Java, and his educational background is he's from he has a bachelor's bachelor's degree from John Hopkins University, and holds a master's degree from Columbia University. I've given uh, Stephen a small introduction, but before we dive in deeper with the questions, Stephen, could you give us a more in-depth uh, introduction about yourself and your company? And if you have any slides that you'd like to share, well, you're welcome to do so. Uh, and wait a minute, uh, while Stephen goes through in into his introduction and answering questions, uh, could, I ask, uh, could I remind everyone and could I ask the audience for his questions for Stephen and Anderson, and we'll pick the best questions to ask him after the short Q&A session with myself. Okay, okay, hello guys. Uh, nice to meet you all. Thank you, Bimo, for uh, having me and inviting me. And uh, yeah, that's, uh, I would love to share my screen and uh, get to knowing deeper about my business. Okay, guys, so today I would like to pitch my business and as well as sharing a video of ours later uh, at the end of the pitch. And uh, so, yeah, we are super. So super is basically the largest social commerce platform in Indonesia. We are the Pintuotuo of Indonesia model. So to give you some background, what is Pintuotuo? Pintuotuo is the largest Chinese social commerce platform that is listed as NASDAQ and they are now 200 billion plus USD company. So in Indonesia, we're making one like them and we're now the largest and leading the market share in uh, social commerce industry in Indonesia. The convictions of building super came when I was a kid. I grew up in a family business in retail and they are one of the market leader serving after second tier cities up to rural Indonesia. One of the greatest finding when I was a kid and traveling with my dad to visit these small cities is that second tier cities and third tier cities and Indonesia rural supply chain is broken. At Super, we try to see that in two different lens. First is consumer, second is suppliers. From consumers, there are two greatest problems when you go to these small cities, especially in Indonesia's village, such as number one, logistical limitations, whereas villagers need to travel more than one kilometer away from their house to find the nearest grocery stores that can provide them with good prices. And on the top of that, they need to pack all of those goods inside that mini motorcycle that they had to bring all of those goods back home. Second, what we found out when we go to that smaller cities, 
the supply chain gonna tend to get more complex. Sometimes it is very, very long. As a result, the price could surge more than 20% and it is less affordable for villagers. At Super, we try to make their life better. So we were solving those logistical limitations by empowering community leaders in the rural Indonesian areas to become our resellers, to aggregating the demand and the orders of their neighborhoods to make every single transaction more affordable. Therefore, villagers now can sit back at home and we're the one who are going to do all of the homework. And we found out that once we built this hyperlocal supply chain, the supply chain team tends to be more simple and less complex and the price only surges up to 16%. And this is 30% that better than the incumbent supply chain. Second, on the suppliers, or we talk as manufacturers, big FMCG brands over here. There are three, three main problems that now they are facing. First is high salesman cost. Second, 80% of their revenue only come from 20% pipeline that they have. So they have a very high business risk of if, if all of these things all of those like pipeline gone, it's gonna be putting them at the high, highest stake of risk to risking their business collapse. Lastly, they've been tracking everything manually. Therefore, they have limited visibility in distributing goods across Indonesian's villages. So we're trying to solve that problem by now they could eliminate their salesman's costs. Second, tapping to our resellers, those are thousands that are spread in those small villages now they'll be able to diversify their sales pipeline. And lastly, we've been tracking everything digitally and share that data to them. And therefore, they will have a better visibility in distributing the goods in Indonesian villages. Before I dig deeper into the business model and our achievement, basically, we have four main business flow. That is, first, our resellers will aggregate the demand of their community. And basically, they'll punch the order in the app. And once they punch the order in the app, uh, once it triggers to the minimum group buying, we will deliver all of those goods to their super reseller's house. They can do the payment in two ways. One is bank transfer and second is COD. Super resellers is the one who are going to do the last mile delivery to the end users. So why now? Of the light of the first wave of e-commerce, or maybe you've heard this player like Tokopedia, Bukalapak, Lazada, and Shopee been around in the market, 10 years plus, billion dollars of investment. They can only capture 5% out of Indonesia's total offline retail market. This number tells something that in order to crack the rest 90% plus of the offline in Indonesia's retail market need to be have another, another touch such as online to offline. And that's what we're doing over here. And we got a rising Indonesian middle class, which is 54 million populations in Indonesia that will become the backbone of super business. And now with COVID-19 tailwind, our business is growing even faster because there are limited options for people to buy groceries due to the lockdown. And why we can be succeed and growing so fast this day, because most of these people inside the villages to give you some background, we don't operate in Jakarta and having our sales in Jakarta. We have like zero active zero percent activity in Jakarta. Everything is happening at second tier cities up to rural Indonesia, because those are the area where as physical presence is still important. Therefore, the super resellers is kind of like the catalyst for the rest of the community to buy things online. And second, they have low digital literacy and limited infrastructure, and that's why that's where we are coming in to build this hyperlocal product and hyperlocal a hyperlocal supply chain to make every single thing more efficient on the ground. And the total addressable market is huge. To give you some knowledge that 75% out of Indonesia's total populations came from second tier, third tier city and Indonesia rural areas, which consists of 230 million people. We started with FMCG sector, which gives us a total addressable market of 121 billion USD. At Super, we're very ambitious. We're gonna go as far as possible by adding more SKUs later on, such as fashions, cosmetic, and more that will enlarge the total addressable market up to 200 billion USD plus. And this is the thing that the other player or the other business didn't notice that Indonesia is such a very massive market, but everyone been having a main focus and concentrations in Jakarta. So in a way, we're trying to help our nations and the visions of super is to help Indonesia 
to solve the inequality economic distributions across second tier cities up to rural by making every single transactions more affordable for the villagers by having this immense network of resellers and hyper local supply chain that will help our economy of Indonesia going onward. So after all, I can disclose some of our data, but due to the NDA, I cannot be like very direct. But after years we've been running, our applications have processes more than multi millions USD transactions per month. And we have thousands of resellers and hubs. Maybe um, Bimo mentions about uh, the kiosk. So we use that kiosk for uh, the hubs to supply the resellers, which I'm, going, which I'm going to get to that slide later. And we have attracted 100 billions of IDR investment to support itself. And some of them are the top tier uh, venture capital as well as investment fund, such as Y Combinator that have backed Airbnb and Dropbox before. We also have some of the uh, great angels, such as the current World Bank Managing Director, Ibu Mari Alka Pangestu, as well as Jay-Z, the American rapper, and um, a VC that is founded by a Facebook co-founder called B Capital. So aside of those um, achievements, we're also maintaining a deep friendship and relationship with top Indonesian suppliers. Mostly now we've been taking the products directly from the first chain and working with top uh, 50 plus Indonesian manufacturers and offer 600 plus SKUs on our platform. And then since then, the gross margins have been, been growing so fast. Um, we got some of the exclusive trade program. Usually we work with this brand like Nutrisari, Sasa, and Tech Puchuk to also do their marketing campaign on the ground, tapping those villages that they haven't been there before. So three of the greatest competitive advantages that we're trying to build over here is that maybe you've heard GNE or Sichapat or whatsoever. That's basically whereas people starting e-commerce or whatsoever, they will be relying on the first national 3PLs of Indonesia, which the price is going to be very, very expensive if you're trying to sell as well as deliver all of those products to Indonesian villages. What we're trying to do is very different. So for the supply chain, we usually work with local people that, has, uh, that works like a partner. And those are the supply chain community that has an immense network of supply chain community, like in another like Indonesian villages, like small uh, villages. And we, we're kind of like uh, be able to work with them, gather them. And the price is going to make our delivery price 90% cheaper compared to using g &E and other things. So this is one of the greatest competitive advantages that we've had. So that's why we're calling us building this hyperlocal supply chain. Second is that uh, we have a lot of initiative like uh, do mini offline roadshow inside the village to basically aggregating and inviting these community leaders to become hyperlocal resellers community that has a network effect. And once you'll be able to build like this network effect in your app business, usually it's really hard for any other competitor to kind of like reverse back the engineer that network of effect because it's going to require a high switching cost for them to basically onboarding to your platform. Lastly, we're building a hyper-local product as part of the profitability path of the business, meaning that we're building our FMCG product. Uh, let me tell you a story that it's been years that people try to copy paste Coca-Cola in the US. Even uh, Richard Benson they tried to meet, make, meet this virgin cola back then, and they couldn't do it. Same thing with uh, what happening with hyper-local white labeling product. We believe once we uh, scale that up, it's really hard for any other competitors kind of like reverse back the engineer of the ingredients that we've had. So the 10 years ahead or like 100 years ahead, where we want to go. Uh, social commerce and pin to -to business model is just basically to build this resource network on the ground. So imagine us like fun functioning this young mom inside the village to become Indomaret of their community or like Walmart of their community. But in the next 10 years or so, we would love to become um, the Indofood or like probably Walmart of Indonesia without having a presence of retail store and having a very efficient marketing. Like Walmart in the US, you'll see like some of the white labeling things on, on the rack that they sell. And usually it's become one of the, their greatest profit generator. We also have that now. Those are super care and super eats. And super distributor is like Walmart has these kind of like warehouses that distributing all of the goods to uh, their retails in, uh, in the US. So we also have that super warehouse that we always locate that super warehouse near the village that we cover. And that super center means that that is a smaller hub that you usually work with 
uh, warung or we call it uh, mom and pops in English. And basically these two are the hyperlocal infrastructure that we've had to distributing the goods with hyperlocal supply chain that we've had to the retailers. And our retailers mean that is our super resellers that will distribute all of the goods to Indonesian villagers. So before I end my pitch, I would love to share you a short story of ours. Uh, this is me back then. It was uh, uh, nine years ago. So I feel so old right now uh, seeing you guys. I used to become the president of Premier SBZ back then. And this was nine years ago. Uh, one of the greatest lessons when I was young back then, when I was sitting at your uh, seat right now, is that I would be able to find my life convictions faster. So the convictions that I've got is basically after I spoke with several of young mom who I met in one of the Indonesian villages. She told me that with a bug in their hand, they could only purchase a cup of milk for their kids. And our dream at Super is very simple. We're trying to simplify this hyperlocal supply chain to make every single transaction more affordable for them. Therefore, the same moms that we spoke before with the same amount of money in their hand, they would be able to purchase more milk for their kids and save some money to educate their kids to go to college someday. So the convictions that I've got to help all of these people in the village stick in my mind and to give you some knowledge out of like every single job that you're gonna do after you graduated from university, 95% of your day is gonna be gloomy day. Only 5% is gonna be blue sky. Those are the achievements that you've got. Um, in every interview and whatsoever that I've been through, and whenever they ask me how to become a startup founder, I never encourage someone to become a startup founder, but I encourage someone to find the life convictions because that is the most important thing. It is not a must to become a startup founder because that's not the best job that people could ever get. I would argue it's one of the hardest jobs that people could ever get. So I always encourage people to find the passions of the life. If you end up finally to become a public official and working at the public office whatsoever, it's good. If you're becoming an executive working as a consultant, engineers, or even startup founders, it's also good. So every path is good. One of the greatest things that you need, you need to find in life in your 20s up to 30 is to find your life passions because that life passion is basically more important than becoming a startup founder and make you guys alive every single day to basically pursue your dream and make your dream come true someday. So I think that's that. I'll leave it there. I'll leave it here before I um, basically close my pitch. Would love to share a short, a short story of ours in a form of video of what we've done in 2020 and how does the business process look like. Here you go. Nama saya Rini Lestari, saya seorang super agen. Pertama kali saya kenal super agen di tahun 2018. Pekerjaan sehari-hari saya selain ibu rumah tangga, yang ngumpulin orderan sembako, dan macam-macam barang. Itu genjing Bu Bambang. Ya keliling kampung, ya ke rumah tetangga, bahkan ke warung-warung. Permisi Bu Ganti, gimana bulan ini mau order apa aja? Semangat banget jadi super agen. Karena menurut saya ini kegiatan yang positif. Waktu luang saya bisa dipakai buat bantu nambah penghasilan keluarga. Indonesia consists of 80,000 villages and 230 million people who live in second tier third-tier cities and Indonesian plural. Our nation's GDP has grown 5% year on year. And the next immense wave of the technology disruptions is after second tier, third-tier cities and Indonesian plural. Super is built for three main purposes. The first one is for boosting economical welfare. Second part is equality distribution. And the third part is tackling digital literacy in rural areas. So. With Super, we empower citizens in rural areas to become super agents. And what it means to be super agents is that they can utilize their free time to be more productive by selling goods, FMCG goods, towards their communities. Super is made by Indonesian millennials. 
with a vision to enable affordable goods to people in Indonesian rural areas. Super is a solution for equality, economic distribution in Indonesia. Semua warga kampung sini ikut order ke saya dan merasakan manfaatnya. Dengan menjadi super agen, saya merasa bangga karena bisa membantu meningkatkan ekonomi keluarga. Dan yang terpenting, saya bisa berguna bagi warga sekitar sini. Saya Rini Lestari, super agen bro. Okay. Okay. Wow. Incredible, Stephen. That was extremely informative and inspiring. I myself am a rising senior in the computer science major, aiming to create a startup in the future. I hope. So that really touched me, and I hope I find my passion and as a future startup and to be able to become a market disruptor as a uh, super. And I bet everyone here felt the same uh, as I do. So uh, continuing to the questions uh, for you. Uh, How has a Y Combinator program propelled the de development of um, Nusantara technology, especially Aplikasi Super? As I've seen uh, in your website that you've highlighted that you're a batch winner in 2018. And what aspects has there uh, helped uh, contributed to the success of uh, your company? Sure. Um, first of all, thank you for all of the kind words. Y Combinator being one of the greatest backers of uh, any a company that is backed by YC. I bet Anderson will say the same thing. Um, so the both of YC is uh, make something people want. And during YC, we're not trained to fundraise. We're trained to how to build the greatest product for your users. The first two years of the company is basically uh, the years of your finding product market fit because every assumptions that you make, it's going to fail anyways. So at YC, we're trained to be able to somewhat set the KPI, how to sniff whether you have hit the product market fit and how you're going to spur the growth to basically scale that up. Because uh, raising seed is different battlefield from Series A, right? So YC has a great uh, mentorship in a way how you'll be able to talk with users, what are kind of metrics that you track. Don't be on the media too much. Well, if you're at YC, you're going to kind of like that spotlight. Mostly YC founders are uh, trained not to talk with media too much. And because the first two years of the company is uh, make sure that you're creating the best product that will be able to scale later on because all of those spotlight going to come up once your business is going to grow. So I think one of the greatest uh, learning lesson at YC is uh, make something people want. And on the top of that, we're, YC is pretty much the same like Um, I would say a short course of MBA program. After that, you have this lifetime of like network, network kind of like asset, whereas you can book an office hour uh, with some of the top tier kind of like Silicon Valley uh, legend in technology, such as the CEO of Airbnb, uh, Dropbox, whatsoever. And during the program, you can meet all of them um, in, in within the, those like three to four months to give you some guidance in building uh, the world-class technology company. Okay, that's great. Uh, so, but going back to super, super highly depends on uh, SME technology literacy. So how were you able to persuade them and teach uh, your agents in using your application? Um, yeah, well, I mean, look at the data, right? That out of like 10 years, uh, the first wave of e-commerce in the market, uh, they can only capture 5% out of Indonesia's offline retail market. Uh, people often forget that this number is exist. And um, educating people in Indonesia for technology is not as easy as it is. In fact, there are 180 million mobile penetrations in, in Indonesia. Mostly they can only use Facebook and Google. And this e-commerce transaction is still very, very low. So Super has different approach. We only tap second tier cities up to rural, whereas physical presence still need to be there. What we are utilizing is that we are utilizing the social hierarchy of Indonesia. As Indonesians, we know that People like to buy for something uh, for someone that they know. 
So empowering those community leaders at first, and these community leaders is people that they are trusted, be able to somewhat drag their community to purchase things online. And they're gonna become the catalyst like going here and there inside the village. So in a way in Indonesia, uh, most of, well, I mean, I used to study in the US and when I went back to Indonesia, we're always been in a, kind of like having a dream how to disrupt the whole Indonesian's market whatsoever. But to give you some knowledge, offline, online market is very tiny in Indonesia. The offline market is very deep. And in order to be able to educate this offline market that is very, very deep, you need to always move backward. You cannot move forward. In a way, making assumptions, building product, then you launch, mostly it's going to fail. Because uh, too innovative product, high, too techy product, it's going to fail. It's really hard for these people to understand. So at Super, we're kind of like moving backward in a way, making the offline works first before we're kind of like building the feature and the app. So that's basically the approach that uh, we've had on the ground. So I bet that uh, the cell phone, smartphone, cell uh, smartphone penetration in Indonesia has become an important factor in the development of Super, right? Yes, yes, of course it is. Uh, okay. So Due to the logistics problem that you that I believe you, uh, I think you face, how how are you able to integrate these agents in small villages, and how are you uh, develop this logistics and solving that logistics problem? The more problems, the more opportunities you have. That's basically um, what we see in Super. And if you guys later on, some of you are going to come back and building a startup as well. Um, Indonesia has a lot of problem, and but we're seeing that as an opportunity. Why? Because once we'll be able to crack that, it's really hard for any other people to copy paste you because they have to go all of the mess that they've been through. One of the greatest barrier and challenge that we're facing at Super is distributing these tangible goods to the uh, villagers in Indonesia's rural areas. And often we got some roadblock because some sometimes when we just started to cover certain village. The supply chain doesn't really make sense, right? For example, you try to deliver 10 bucks of product and then the supply chain cost is two bucks. So it's like 20% of that goods itself. Or sometimes it could be like 50%. So the way that we're solving this is actually through three things. First of all, because we're tapping a city or like a small villagers that has smaller GDP per capita compared to Jakarta, then the way that we're doing it, we do group buying. So this aggregating the demand of the order going to make the supply chain costs more efficient because we know what kind of the density in like one village and another village. We've been tracking that in our warehouse management system historically. Therefore, we will we'll be able to make this forecasting of like delivery spot. Second of all, I think I've been mentioning over the deck, while the other player relying more on the national 3PLs logistics, such as GNE, we're building this hyper-local supply chain by working with local vendors and local proxy which is their price is 90% cheaper. Sometimes they're even smarter. They could find a shortcut and those shortcuts not even there in Google map, right? And this kind of like way can make price more cheaper to tap after the village. Lastly, our warehouse is only one chunk of like the asset that we've had, but we've been partnering with thousands plus of like hubs. Those are like kiosks, like mom and pops where we are kind of like store some of the goods before all of those goods been taken out by the super resellers and they're the one who are going to do the last mile delivery in a way this infrastructure is kind of like unique because we're kind of like employing and working together with local people like villagers unlike the other players they usually just open google you know and then call gne having this corporate kind of discount whatever we're kind of like building all of the things like underground and utilizing all of this like local touch to uh, becoming the backbone of the business that's great and uh I saw from your website that besides uh, Super, you also have uh, other product lines in Nusantara technology. And being able to leverage the high uh, cell phone penetration in Indonesia, uh, is this a fact that's why you created Ukepo and, Co uh, and Kepo uh, as uh, your digital media company? Yeah, uh, well, um, would love to go over the history of the company. Uh, that basically the main product of Nusantara technology is super. It's always been super since we uh, went to Y Combinator. However, in startup, um, you're going to make several like pivot along the way. So back in the days when we just started, 
we came out as a media company that want to serve after Indonesians, millennials in second tier cities up to um, basically uh, rural areas. But back then we got two challenges, right? Uh, first, um, media business, you can trap a lot of eyeballs, but in the end, to make a great business, you need to be able to monetize. And the total addressable market for digital ads in Indonesia is re re relatively tiny, which is 1 billion USD, which is 80% of them been taken by Facebook and Google and 20% of them been taken by the tech and you know, there's gonna be like a bunch of startup underneath. So it's really hard for a startup to kind of like scale because once you choose a startup path, it's like, you know, it's a game of growth. You need to grow very fast. You need to have this all of unit economics that growing healthy uh, to make a great company. So eight months after, we're actually a profitable company back then. Uh, I spoke with my co-founder to make these things greater in a way that we get some sense that the second tier cities and rural kind of like market kind of like alive. Why don't we tap into consumer technology? Because 60% of our 60% uh, of Indonesian's GDP is driven by private consumption, and this is where we're kind of like tap in. And uh, the, the the second like pivot that we're making and the product that now we're having as Aplikasi Super Scene's been uh, growing very fast since then and been attracting uh, several like world class uh, venture capital capital later on. But now we're still running in the same group because. Uh, our media business is profitable business, so most of the investors that uh, come, in, come in usually they let it go. In fact, uh, those media business kind of like helping all of the social media presence of Aplikasi Super to be uh, growing fast. In fact, if you see our social in the social commerce space, uh, we're having the largest social media asset, and we've been growing that organically. Okay, that's great. Uh, one more thing. Uh, this is a more personal question. Uh, this entire technology has super, and despite you being so young, what challenges did you face in developing a startup, and how were you able to juggle uh, your life and being able to create such a, a big startup, a market disruptor, despite being so young? Well, I feel so old right now. I mean, <laughs> I mean, seeing you guys, I feel so old right now. But anyways, um, um, later on, when you're about to step your career, um, you're going to find a lot of challenges and uh, um, mid midlife crisis is, is, is a real thing, right? You're going to eventually face that. Some people could face it in the early 20s, mid 20s and late 20s, whatever, you're going to face it, right? Uh, some people are quite lucky. You'll be able to uh, find the convictions early on, as, as I said. But um, yeah, for myself, I think for most of all uh, that went to the US were uh, usually uh, came from a privileged or fortunate family, most of us, right? And and you guys all over the here is very fortunate to have uh, this kind of opportunity to go to the one of the best, um, you know, country with best educations in the world. So use uh, utilize that like as best as possible. And uh, when I came back here, when I was started my business, uh, I didn't get any support from my parents because. Uh, well, I mean, um, I started this like four to five years ago, whereas the startup is not as big as now. Um, Tokopedia and Gojek, uh, they're, they're kind of like starting to become unicorn, but people just starting to get to know like, um, you know, what the heck is this like app thingy and here and there. So my dad often challenged me, hey, like what the heck are you building, right? If you're building a restaurant, I still can see the customers going to the, you know, to your restaurant. And then you're building this like funny app and I don't can even see like, who are your users and you keep burning money like every month with your money. So um, but yeah, I, I met like those days, right? And um, I didn't get any support. Um, as I remember, the credit card was like taken off. I've been living my life and take it for granted when I was in the US right here and there. Never thought about like I would have this life. But um, those, the first two years, the first two years, I never took any salary, like zero, zero, zero salary. And then actually the first three months to four months, I bootstrapped with my uh, own saving. Um, I live the life of like, uh, uh, you know, some, some life that I've never been there. Right. But uh, those things kind of like built the resiliency of, um, you know, uh, myself going onward, because for me, after being through that experience, money can gone in like, you know, in a second and you'll get money in a second, but surviving skill, you're going to stay and stick in your blood till you die. So uh, what I'm pursuing is just while you're young, you need to be able to uh, strengthen your surviving skills. 
because uh, that's the thing that you're going to keep alive. You never know what's going to happen tomorrow. I mean, uh, in startup and even in life later on, once you're stepping out to career, whatever, you never know what's going to happen tomorrow. So you cannot even judge whatsoever. Uh, you also have like this idealism. Back then I have all of this idealism in my head. I want to do A, B, C, D, E. Mostly it failed, right? Um, so I think the challenge is um, be able to survive in this like very hard kind of like heavy pressure in the early days of life. And how to overcome that is just, you need to face it. Even though um, it, it tastes as bad as probably people talk as, uh, as shit, right? And well, you gotta have to eat it and you gotta have to uh, move it because uh, those like um, uh, things gonna make you stronger. And lastly though, um, US might give you some of the best educations. Maybe some of you went to Ivy Lake, you know, UC Berkeley, UCLA, um, some of this good school in um, Boston whatsoever. But in the end, you need to listen. Once you're coming back to Indonesia, you're not the smartest person anymore. Like uh, everything's so different. Um, you you got to have to listen. You need to be able to accept feedback and criticism. And because those feedback and criticism turns that as your breakfast in order to make you guys stronger every day. Because once you think you're smarter than anyone, it is, you know, you're kind of like limiting the gap for you not to grow and not be able to creating like, um, you know, social impact, whatever, through your venture or your career, like later on. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. So I'll get back to Ardian and Vanya. Uh, they're going to uh, get some questions from YouTube. Uh, Ardian, take it from here. Yep. Um, so I've looked into the, uh, the chat and there are a couple of questions uh, for you, Stephen. Um, so first of all, uh, from Diana, distributing products to rural areas must be super challenging. What are your biggest challenges and how do you overcome it? Sure. Um, I think, uh, so, okay, sorry. Okay, um, cool. Um, yeah, so I think the greatest challenge is um, when you go to this rural, right, mostly there are, okay, so Indonesian infrastructure and the way that the city been developed, it's a bit, uh, unique, I would say that's the softer way to put it, right? You, you'll find like this, like big villages. And before that big villages, there is this like very tiny road. So only like, you know, small motorcycle or like small fleets, whatever that could pass. Um, vice versa, you can find like a very like, you know, like a wide road, whatever to access like this uh, villages. But there is this like uh, one, one and a half meter and one meter kind of like sign. <laughs> So actually the, the big truck cannot pass too. Um, so yeah, you're, you're gonna see like all of this like uh, things uh, on the ground, right? And um, one of the greatest challenge when we are tapping in is to be able to digest, like if we are tapping like uh, uh, village A and uh, what are kind of like challenges to uh, tap, what kind of fleets that we need to select because we cannot, you know, send all of those via like big trucks or uh, what, what do you call it in Indonesia? Probably you know, like truck, truck ankle, you know, bentukannya kayak apa semi truck. Uh, sometimes it cannot pass those roads, so we need to be able to utilize this uh, local people that gonna work with us to distributing like uh, fire motorcycle. So um, it, it was a tough start because we don't have like any historical data, and probably one of the greatest problem in these nations is to find data, right? Um, so we'll be able to build from scratch and learn by mistake, learn by doing, and then tracking all of this data that now been in the warehouse management system, because we've been tracking multi-million USD transactions per month. It makes our supply chains getting better over time and making our supply chain more efficient over time and uh, making the route uh, better over time. And also, um, I think the, the second uh, challenge is to find the shortcut, as I mentioned before. Some of this local knows the shortcut, but before that, we are always go with Google Map, right? But some of these people can find a shortcut, and it's there. There's not listed at Google, so that's the thing that we also track, like on the ground. Um, those are two things that becoming the greatest challenge for us, like early in the days, because um, of course, when you started, you want to cover those villages, then the price of the supply chain gonna get very, very high. But over time, we've been like decreasing and making the supply chain more efficient, and that's basically how we're. Uh, doing it is based on data. We track everything. We're kind of like utilizing the data to make our supply chain more efficient day by day. That's th that's a really uh, thorough answer. That's really detailed. And going on to the next question, 
It's from uh, Muhammad Arshad. So how long does it take to make super? So how, how long does it take like from the ideation process until you actually um, launch your company um, in, on, on the ground? And I think uh, from what I remembered, I think you rolled out already in East Java, right? And you're trying to expand to other provinces as well later. So yeah, can you like just elaborate like how long does it take for you? Sure. Um, first of all, um, launching a startup is not as beautiful as that, that they are, right? If you see uh, most of the articles of ours at Forbes or whatsoever, it is just like a glimpse of light. But uh, we've been through like so many failures. The first six months, three to six months of super, it was the, the our tractions is like an airplane runway. So it's flat, uh, you know, there, there's nothing at all, right? What happened was like, we went to Y Combinator and Y Combinator is in Silicon Valley, right? So we're building a product for Indonesian villages from Bay Area. And that's, that was a mistake because uh, back then we moved forward. We're, we're trying to make this like crazy assumptions that, hey, if we're like having feature A, B, C, D, E, whatever, it's gonna work, right? And then once we graduated from YC, we went back to Indonesia and we're kind of like executing it like properly and, uh, you know, um, um, be on the ground and uh, talk with these people. And we failed uh, because some of these people didn't even know like what is this fancy feature really means, right? So after like three to six months, we're kind of like launching another beta of like super, but I, I think I mentioned before, we're kind of like moving backward. So we're kind of talk with users, what they are really need and here and there. And um, it, from that lesson, we kind of like know that to build this app, it has to be very, very simple for villagers. It cannot be like very, very um, uh, complicated. In fact, up to this day, if we want to launch like one feature, we, we're kind of like thinking like three times, four times, five times, because it can be like, it can be like double ad sport for us because in a way the backfire is like people are gonna don't know how to use it. And then this customer service is gonna be uh, bummed by a lot of this like uh, calls that, um, make a lot of teams, uh, you know, a, a lot of hassle, right? And then, uh, yeah, and then it, it's, 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 it's basically hard to execute uh, this kind of like uh, tech thingy in Indonesia. So uh, out of like those two, three to six, uh, we're kind of like find the product market fit for the technology product. And over that three to six, I think at the six month, we're kind of like having a, a kind of like a good, good way to say that this is hits the product market fit after we've been through like several iterations. And since then, uh, the applications has grown. And we're now in East Java, but look at this way. Uh, East Java is the second uh, biggest uh, province GDP after Jakarta. If you see Jakarta is 200 billion USD and it's a red oceans market, people been uh, having a main focus over there. Uh, we're thinking about uh, going like aside in East Java because there are less competitions over here, of, of course, right? Everybody is still in uh, Jakarta. Probably you can see online, Shop is still hiring Cristiano Ronaldo to do this dancing, uh, you know, crazy dancing. And then you'll see like Tokopedia counter that with BTS, whatever. And it's still like going on, right? So we're thinking that we're trying to hit the hidden gem at the Eastern part of Indonesia. We started with East Java. And uh, again, the way that the business work is like O2O, right? It's like semi-retail. In Indonesia, it's a bit different from the US. Whereas in the US, you have that maturity of digital literacy. You have Amazon in Seattle. You do like push on Google, Facebook, then the whole market gonna absorb it. And they have like 50 to 60% of the uh, offline retail market share. This is not what happening in Indonesia, right? People, I mean, using a mobile phone, but mostly they're using for Facebook and Google and WhatsApp chat, that's it. So they don't really use like the other uh, platform. So we need to do it step by step. That's basically the approach. And that's why we're coming with East Java. And after, I think this year, somewhere this year, we are planning to go after the Eastern part of Indonesia. Take an example, if we're going to East Kalimantan, then this, there's gonna be like another 40 billion of GDP. 40 billion of GDP in East Kalimantan plus East Java, it's already 200 billion USD. Same thing like in Jakarta, right? So we're thinking, you know, getting 5% of the market shares in uh, this area, which is totally different than Jakarta, going to make us become a very, very big business and a very unique business because the trade and the DNA of the app is built outside of Jakarta. 
So think as super, right? As a, if you see like Gojek, Tokopedia, Traveloka as a metropolitan kid, right? Metropolitan app. They was born and grew up there. Kita jadi kayak anak kampung gitu. Yeah, so we're like a villagers app that was born and grew up in second tier cities up to rural. So that's how I put it. Yeah, um, I, I believe um, that the challenge here is educating the rural areas. And then I think online to offline is a good um, option here for you to start off um, launching the app, especially in the rural areas, which where like digital literacy is not as uh, much, I mean, uh, as, as significant as in the um, urban areas. So uh, towards uh, the final question here uh, from Sadhvi Raspati, I think it's more on like how you find conviction. So do you have like any tips on how you can actually find your passion or, or how, how did you actually find your conviction in the first place to start this business? I think it's uh, very important for you because like um, doing this kind of business is hard. So we need like that source of motivation that reminds you day by day that this this business is like worth um, striving for. So can you talk more about that? Sure. Um, well, I mean, uh, uh, probably my friend Anderson uh, over here is gonna uh, talk the same thing. But um, there are many uncertain things that gonna happen in in our life after you graduate from college. What does it mean? In college, you're kind of still be able to have a higher degree of control in a way. If you work hard, you study hard, you could get an A, right? But that's not like what happening in life. In life, you need to sit yourself in the parallel of universe, what you want to achieve. And there has always been a probability to fail. But if you work hard and you're uh, putting more time on that um, sector whatsoever, I'll, I'll say that there is serendipity, right? Where you can get like this luck and hard work together and you're going to make a great things. So um, to find the convictions, is basically you'll be able to know by now where you are by choosing the major. Um, you know, it can be an engineer, computer science, whatever. Um, that's basically the convictions that you've got. But sometimes people could also think that this is not the thing that you want to do once you're in that major. And, it, that, and that's fine. You know, people could shift the career whatsoever. But the first thing before you'll be able to find that convictions is to be able to understand what do you want, as simple as that. Don't go crazy, oh, I want to make like, you know, the next whatever, Gojek for Indonesia, like Grab, whatever. That, that's like going to fall in the end because mostly those like plan going to change. But the first thing that um, if I have to reverse back my time and thinking where I was 20-ish, early 20s back then, it is that that um, what I am, what I would love to uh, you know, be in for a while and where I want to be, who, who are the people that I want to help. And uh, since I grew up in, you know, in a family business that's serving this second tier cities up to rural, I kind of like want to help them since I was a kid. And then I have this kind of like technology and like retail background, whatever. So all of those things are combining. Uh, that, that super was born, right? So in a way, it's like a mixture of... Uh, I would say combinations, what you have done in the past, what you have done now, and you have to sit there for a while to be patient. And again, people time zone are different, right? Uh, you cannot, you know, uh, justify for yourself. Uh, once you're graduated, you're going to see someone, you know, uh, making a business and they're thriving faster than yours. Never, never, ever compare like their life to yours because that time you're comparing yourself, you're insulting yourself. People have their own time zone. You got to be patient until you find the convictions. As I told you, some people got very, very lucky. They could find it at the early 20s. But some people can can, can get it at you know mid-20 and like uh, late 20. But again, lifespan of human is like 80 years old. So don't worry. You'll, you'll get there, right? It's about like passions and uh, sitting on like things that you love. And later on, you'll find that convictions. And then you know kind of like niche and opportunity to tap and how to build a great venture later on. Yep. I agree. I think it kind of reassures us that um, as college students, I mean, we don't need to worry more on like if like other people, other people are like more successful than us. Uh, people uh, run from their own pace. And I think different people have their, their own different capabilities and just trust in yourself. Um, just trust in your own capabilities. And if you do that, I think, and you're confident with that, 
and then I think you'll just you'll get what you want in the future. So I think just to close off uh, Stephen's uh, talk, thank you so much, Stephen, uh, for uh, giving that pitch to us. Makes us understand um, like the whole business model of super. I think it's super in informative in which it kind of inspires us like to make a business that not only is profitable, but can also be impactful to the society, especially to the rural areas in which it is starting to grow now. I think with super, I believe it can create another trajectories uh, for, especially in the industry 4.0, as it integrates the rural economy and the urban economy. So yeah, thank you so much, Stephen. And thank you after, so much. Yeah, maybe we can jump into Cherise and Cherise can introduce our next speaker, uh, Anderson Sumarli, the CEO and co-founder of uh, Agile Securitas. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Steven, thank you so much. We're very grateful for the knowledge and also insight that you shared on your work uh, in consumer technology. So thank you. Uh, but now we're also very excited to hear from a fellow Y Combinator graduate, I'm very excited to be welcoming our next speaker, uh, Anderson Sumarli. Anderson is CEO and co-founder of Ajaib, an online investment startup platform that recently raised 25 million uh, in Series A led by Horizon Ventures and Alpha GWC. Prior to current work, he's worked at JP Morgan, IBM, and Boston Consulting Group. Um, Anderson obtained his bachelor's degree in finance from Cornell University and an MBA from the Stanford Graduate School of Business. So welcome, Anderson. Um, please take it away. Hi, Cherise, and hi, everybody. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. You know, as I was thinking about what to, what to tell you guys today, I kind of reflected on my own time as a student back then. And uh, I still remember that as a student, I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do after college, um, and then eventually after uh, my master's degree. And you know, I can only imagine the position that you guys are in amidst the pandemic. Um, you know, I think that uh, it's a unique time. And so I think this is a very timely uh, session to have as you think about your future careers. And so what I'd like to do today is I'll give a quick introduction about myself and a bit about the company. And uh, I wanna give a bit more time for you guys to just ask me questions. Um, I see we have about like 70 to 80 people right now watching on YouTube. This will be much funner if you guys engage. So please um, put in questions, comments, and anything uh, on, on YouTube, and I'm happy to answer them. But uh, to give a quick background about myself, um, I, uh, I went through my undergrad, as mentioned, at Cornell. Back then, there were so few Indonesians there that we didn't even have a Permias. We had an equivalent of that uh, called Cornell Indonesia Association, which I was a vice president in, but a very small community. And then in my master's degree, I went to Stanford. That's even fewer Indonesians. And so we don't have a Permias at all there. And we barely even had an Indonesian student association there. So I have much appreciation to what you guys have done um, for other schools in, in, in the US. And a bit jealous at that too. That's a quick introduction about myself. Uh, let me share a bit of materials about, about my company. Cherise, can you allow me to share a screen? Yes, give me one sec. All right. Okay. Let me know if it shows up on your screens. All right. So just a quick introduction. What is Ajaibe? Uh, we are an online stockbroker that offers both stocks and mutual funds in Indonesia. We have over a million users. We represent about a quarter of all stock investors in Indonesia. Uh, they're all on our platform. And uh, kind of a brief background about our product itself. Uh, we pride ourselves with a quick account opening process, 100% online, very quick, very straightforward, uh, no minimums whatsoever. You can start um, you know, buying and selling stocks uh, from your phone with, uh, with a very affordable pricing. And, uh, you know, if you invite your friend, you also get a free stock to start off with. And uh, just to walk you through a bit more about our product, so you have a sense of, of what we've built. Um, 
uh, basically our product is mobile first, but we also have uh, a, web, a web version of the product. You guys can, you guys should be able to download it. If you guys search for Ajib in both App Store um, as well as Google Play. Uh, kind of you start off coming in with opening your account, filling out your what we call a KYC process. And for majority of people, the very next day, you can already start trading stocks. Uh, you top up uh, funds into your account. And uh, then you can start uh, discovering the stocks that, that you guys love. And majority of it uh, that people love are like, um, uh, are like uh, bank stocks, like BCA, or they go telco stocks like Telcom and things like that. Uh, and it's a very easy and simple flow for beginners. If you guys have never invested in Indonesian stocks before, it's very easy, straightforward, just buy and sell, choosing the stocks that you wanna, uh, you wanna be invested in. Uh, give you a, a very straightforward status, whether it's match, is open or rejected. So, so nothing complex in the language that we use because we're targeting first time investors in our product. Uh, we also have very affordable uh, fees. So we're up to 50% cheaper. Uh, than uh, our biggest competitor in, in the market. And we made it on purpose so that first-time investors don't feel too scared to start uh, trying. And they don't feel scared about making mistakes because the fees are actually pretty low. And other kind of main features that we pride ourselves on, uh, we have a news feature where you can actually uh, kind of read Bloomberg style news from all over the place, specifically for stocks. And we have a competitive ranking for, for folks who uh, are finance majors here, like myself, you know, this is something that uh, is your bread and butter. You understand this already, but for other people who uh, are just starting out, we make it very easy for uh, first time investors to understand the financial health of a company. We do this thing called competitive ranking where we use um, uh, automated systems and algorithms to rank a certain company within its own industry for certain uh, attributes of uh, their financials. So for example, a lot of people don't understand is that 34 and a half percent are away good or bad, right? But well, here we can show you that for this uh, company, Sido, it's actually ranked number two in, in the consumer space among 61 other uh, public companies in their subsectors. And so overall, you can see that the status of this company, financials actually very good or sangat baik. So it kind of make it easier for people to digest information. Uh, we also do a lot of like technical analysis as well for some of these folks who um, are engineering majors or, or, or love data science. You know, that's what we've embedded into the company. My first job out of college is actually as a data scientist. And so, so we put in features on technical analysis, Fibonacci pivot points and other technical indicators to inform our customers when would be the right time to, to enter or, uh, or exit the stock market or a certain stock position. We also have velocity price alerts. Kind of the, the perk of being a mobile first broker in Indonesia is that you can take advantage of this mobility that your customers have on, on your phones. So we, we give uh, velocity price alerts in the last 10 minutes. If there's uh, significant movements in prices, we inform you. And this is also kind of another use case that we have with automated algorithms and machine learnings and things like that, that we've integrated into our product. Um, and uh, of course we have a watch list here where you can track some of your favorite stocks and also get to know others that uh, you, know, you wanna track better. And very important for a product is education. And I think that this is something that, that Steven mentioned earlier as well. You know, we're all fortunate to be, the, to, to afford us education outside, right? But uh, you know, not everybody is in that same position as we are. And so we as a company at Ajayab, a huge part of our mission is to actually educate uh, consumers in Indonesia to start financial planning and, and being invested. So we believe in financial deepening beyond just financial inclusion, which means that we actually want people to understand what they're doing beyond just opening up bank accounts or um, you know, borrowing from these uh, consumer peer-to-peer -peer lenders and things like that. So we actually invest a lot in our education. We run the largest website for investment content in the Indonesian language today. Um, and we've just invested so much into creating newer and newer content to get people to and uh, to, to, to learn how to invest from zero to one. Uh, and we have this really cool feature for folks who have tried our product or are 
going to think about trying our product, you, you get a free stock, a free random stock if you go and um, get a friend to also invest. And so uh, a lot of uh, kind of our outreach is through friend to friend referrals or through organic means by online education. Um, so that's just like a quick, uh, a quick uh, introduction about, about our product. And, uh, you know, I also want to take this time to, to show, you, uh, show you a picture. So let me know if it pops up on your screen. All right. So Stephen mentioned about how, how difficult entrepreneurship is. And so I want to leave you guys with this story. This is me at school while I was building my company. So I actually built my company while I was still at school. Um, I basically took my, what was supposed to be my internship to actually go and, and fundraise for the company. Um, and the first year was terrible, right? The first year, basically, as you can see, my apartment was empty. I was eating out of uh, cardboard boxes. <laughs> we we're sitting on the floor. We, you know, part of it is that I was so busy building a company that I had no time to actually, um, to actually make up all these furnitures that I bought from Ikea. Like I had absolutely no time to build up a table. And so, uh, you know, I'd buy a lot of things from Amazon and I would use the box actually as our, as our table. And, you know, we would eat uh, really quickly for five minutes. This is my other, this is my roommate actually. He also was starting a startup um, at the same time with me as well. But, you know, there's a lot of sacrifices that you need to do. And going to entrepreneurship is not easy, but it's super rewarding. But kind of the first one to two years, you're going to be trying to find your footing. A lot of people are going to say no to you. There's a lot of people that don't believe in what you're doing. But along the way, you're going to start getting people who starts to believe in you, starts believing in what you're doing. And before you know it, you have uh, a lot of people around you that is a great support system for you. But, you know, I guess this is half, you know, half an encouragement, but also half of it is that I, I, I want you know, us um, to be open eyes when you enter into this career, right? It's, uh, it's not for everybody, but it's for those who have a deep passion for a certain product or a certain problem that they're, that they're frustrated enough uh, because of a lack of solutions to that product or, or, or that problem that you feel like you're the best in the world at addressing that problem yourself, right? So, I love to encourage people to take on entrepreneurship path. I love the energy of people, young people who have these ideas for a better future. And I do think that we also have a sense of responsibility as, 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 as people who were afforded this incredible opportunity to get a foreign education and being exposed to all these other uh, incredible products and people around the world, right? To actually bring it back to, to, to where we came from, to Indonesia and um, create these positive externalities from, from what we've gathered abroad, right? So I wanna leave you off to, uh, with that. And uh, I wanna give a bit more time uh, to answer any questions so that I can answer everything that's on top of your mind. Yeah, thanks for that reminder, Anderson. I think um, as students or anyone watching, I think that's, that's a great starting point, you know, um, realizing and also pinpointing um, where where are our stresses and like what what type of things are actually in our mind um, as a starting point to our entrepreneurship journey. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Um, I was wondering. So um, prior to Ajayip, we actually had a professional career, um, and maybe if you can share how has those experience uh, experiences like working in BCG or IBM uh, how's how has that shaped your analytical or leadership skills um, that was very essential in building Ajayip. Yeah, so my background before a job has always either been in finance or technology because that's what I really love doing is merging the two worlds together. So my first foray to technology was right out of college. Um, I worked as a data scientist at IBM in their chief analytics office in New York. Uh, there I had this exposure, incredible exposure where I was able to help implement data science across IBM offices in Asia as well as in Europe. That maybe fell in love with data 
with information, with analytics, um, and really created this, um, this culture around me that I bring till today in the company of a data-driven decision-making process that's zero ego and uh, you know, less about opinions, but more about uh, what is a cold hard facts. And after doing that for a couple of years, I decided I want to head back to Indonesia, be closer with my family, as I'm sure a lot of uh, you folks listening to this are perhaps also thinking about at this moment. And uh, I, uh, I, I, I went back and I joined BCG and they were at a pretty interesting intersection at that point. They were doing a lot of projects around financial services and, and technology there. So I was very fortunate to, to be able to help a couple of the financial service companies in Indonesia make that leap to digital. And it's been informative to me because I've started realizing more and more how broken a lot of the things are, uh, in, in, you know, and uh, how much there's so much opportunity to build um, uh, financial infrastructure backbone in, in, the, in the side of the world. Uh, and in particular, I uh, fell in love with personal finance and investments as a financial service category that I felt was... Um, was just screaming for new innovation that nobody was, was giving off, right? So I would say kind of my experience from corporate world has really informed me in who I am today and how I build a job. But I would also say like, <clears throat> you know, I always hire learning animals um, as opposed to resumes. I would hire people who would learn and learn and learn as opposed to people who've gone for achievements. And I think that if you're a learning animal, regardless of what your background is, whether you join a family business after this, you go to government or you try your entrepreneurship journey or whatever you do, you're going to learn. And that's going to contribute to the next journey in your life. And if it ends up being an entrepreneurial journey, you're, you're going to really benefit based out of whatever your experience is. So to me, I think it's less so of my experience in a certain company or my experience in corporate as opposed to others. But it's more of like that mindset of you know, wanting to always learn. Yeah, I agree. I think um, it's what you make of the experience rather than just the brand name. So mm -hmm. um, thank you for that reminder. Um, also, on the topic of financial inclusion, you mentioned, um, you know, putting such emphasis on education and also, uh, you know, educating Indonesians about financial planning and also financial deepening in particular. Um, so uh, I know that you're already taking steps into, you know, um, envisioning a future of financial inclusion of, of a more deep financial inclusion in Indonesia but um, you know what are some of the steps that um, maybe like the long-term goals um, that Ajayp has to address that also one of the big things here is that there's very few people who are aware about the importance of investing and I think like it's much more uh, it's this is, if not the most relevant time to be thinking about financial planning and investments right during the pandemic. Uh, there's only less than 1% of the population in Indonesia invested in stocks, right? And if you look at our neighbors in Thailand, they're already at 3%. In India, that's already about 2.5%. So, like, and, and there's no cultural reason why Indonesians are not invested in stocks. I mean, Indonesians invest in just about any, any other things as well that's not, you know, um, from the formal sector or, or capital markets, right? And, and so I think that stocks as a vehicle to get the population um, for upward mobility uh, from middle income to middle upper uh, is very important because if we look at India and China, that's just what has happened. The fact of the matter is that the world we live in or the country we live in right now has low um, interest rates and savings accounts and, and really relatively higher uh, inflation rates. And so the only way for people to, as a population, uh, benefit from upward mobility of our fast growing nation is actually to be invested in capital markets where they can benefit as well uh, from all these companies increasing valuation due to the development uh, of, of our country as a whole. So I think that's a huge mission is to educate that to people. Uh, I, I really want to get it from less than 1% up to 3%, similar to Thailand. And I think there's a huge opportunity to go even more than that. 
uh, because Indonesia has a high GDP per capita and, um, and just this huge opportunity um, due to the fast growing uh, pace of our nation. Um, and education is a whole, is a big, big part of that. And in particular, I think that education through online means, through digital means, such as these things, uh, I do this a lot as well, um, and also write articles and things like that to touch on the mass scale is kind of the preferred approach that we take to educating the masses. Yeah, thank you. I think like, you know, um, as a financial service and also, you know, um, having like larger banks uh, being your fierce competition, um, do you think um, is that any is that any um, is that a competition for you, or uh, do you think you're very confident that you know your uh, competencies are uh, beyond what they can achieve currently? Yeah. So these are not competitors. These are friends. In the same industry doing the same thing. <laughs> You know, I think that the, the market is just so huge with, with right now, it's so underpenetrated right now, less than 1% of the population invested in stocks that it just doesn't make sense to compete with each other. You know, it makes a lot more sense for us to just collaborate and educate the public, you know, together. It just focuses on our own products. And if our product is really great and the public's educated, they're going to choose our products, right? So even in our education uh, efforts, we, we don't really talk about our app or ask them to download it or actually use it. That we, we give it off for free, uh, all these like online content through our RG Live. If you guys are interested to see what's going on in the market in Indonesia, we do it every, every morning in Indonesia on IG Live. And you can also go onto our website, ijab.co.id and get like thousands and thousands of um, materials to learn about investing for millennials in the Indonesian language, right? And we just give it off for free. Like, I think that the industry should be working together uh, as a whole to go and grow this uh, awareness of investing because it's good for the market anyways. And just be confident with your own products that your own product is going to attract a certain segment and it's going to be very sticky with that segment. Right. Um, thanks for, you know, reframing our mindset and you know, <laughs> uh, thinking into how you look at that. But... Um, last question before we move on to the uh, comments um, that people have for you. Um, you know, um, upon building your marketing strategy, um, I think we, we noticed that, um, you know, you decided to ride on the trend of, um, I guess, like going into the Korean, um, Korean uh, Hallyu stars craze. Um, how was that like uh, planning that and also, um, yeah, what, what are the other marketing strategies that you're fo focusing on to grow um, Ajay? Yeah, so that was actually a pretty organic thing that happened. So one thing led to another, as actually most of the things in startups <laughs> end up being. So, uh, you know, I was doing um, a lot of online education events similar to this one. And I just started having people commenting saying Hanji Pyong, Hanji Pyong, uh, for those who actually watch uh, the Netflix series Startup, that's where our brand ambassador is, is from. And I just started trying to think like, who is this guy? Because I, I wasn't watching the show, right? And the more I was looking into who Hanji Pyong is, apparently he's this um, very popular celebrity, Korean celebrity in Indonesia, because everybody watches this show Startup on Netflix. And he is a venture capitalist who made his initial fortunes investing in stocks. And he comes from a nobody background. Um, and that story just spoke to us as a team a lot in Ajay. Uh, kind of our mission is actually to bring people up in their social mobility. And so we, we really truly feel that having equal access to the capital markets is the greatest equalizer in democratizing finance for the mass public, basically splitting off all these gains that these big bankers and rich people traditionally gets from this fast growing nation that we have, but giving out to everybody. So everybody gets a small piece of BCA, a small piece of other fast growing, fast growing companies in, in our nation, right? So I thought this is pretty cool. I reached out to a friend uh, out in Korea, uh, and uh, they reached out to another friend and we were able to get in touch with Kim Sun Ho. Um, and uh, 
we were very fortunate. We were able to get the deal done very quickly. And, uh, you know, now he's a brand ambassador for, for Ajayib. And, you know, it's the, the best part about that is that it really inspired a lot of young people in Indonesia to see that uh, figure that they can relate to at some level, also be invested in stocks. And, and that has encouraged people to also uh, start trying to, 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 to invest in stocks. Uh, with regards to the other marketing initiatives that we do, we actually don't really do a lot of marketing initiatives. Uh, we barely do any ads or anything like that. What we really believe in is a, if to, to, to teach people how to invest for the first time, it's more longer engagement, education engagement. And so we make like long form um, YouTube videos. We, we go on all these uh, IG lives and all these other sessions, educate people, we just write content. And we just believe that if you have a great product, um, it's going to speak for itself and you're going to benefit a lot from organic word of mouth or referrals. And I think it's a lesson for, for everybody to learn as well. You know, when you start a company, it's not about burning money on marketing. Uh, my friend Steven also barely spends on marketing at all. It's really about building the right product market fit. And for us, the marketing here is like the second part of market, but it's not necessarily the traditional advertising marketing for us. Couldn't agree more. Um, yeah, perfectly said. Um, I think we're going to move on to the next portion, uh, which will be led by Vanya and uh, Ardian. Um, we'll be taking in the questions from uh, the audience. So yeah, guys, take it away, please. Thank you. Thank you, Sharice. Hi, everyone. I'm Vanya. Um, so we have a few questions from you guys for Anderson, and I will be reading some of them. Um, the first question that we have here is, how did you handle adversity and doubt people who maybe didn't believe in your vision? Well, I think that's always tough, right? I think it just comes down to grit and like having the right support systems. See, if you guys ever take the path of entrepreneurship, I can guarantee you nobody in your family or your friends would understand what you're going through ever. Um, so typically kind of the support system comes from other entrepreneurs as well. And, uh, you know, Steven and I are actually very, very close friends. <laughs> like, uh, so we, we always support each other uh, through the ups and, and the downs as well. I think that a true sign of an entrepreneur is if you get shut down and you just get more motivated to prove those people wrong. If you get shut down and you just decide to lay on your back, right? You know, probably is not the right path for you because um, it's, it's, it's not gonna be, you're not gonna be happy basically, right? So, you know, in the beginning, almost everybody would doubt us, right? And, um, you know, we were nobodies, nobody knew about us. We were trying to create something um, new in the market, right? But you just gotta have grit and conviction in yourself, conviction in your thesis, conviction in your business and your people and have the right support system with other entrepreneurs that might understand better where you're at in the journey to get you through it. But it's a, it's a good test of yourself as well. Do you, do you feel more motivated if somebody turns you down or do you feel like you wanna lay on your back? That's, that's a true test of an entrepreneur. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, I think we, everyone can learn from your approach. Um, we have another question from Raina er Ernawan. Uh, what are your thoughts on the Robinhood situation in the US? Do you think apps like Robinhood are manipulating the market by not allowing users to buy more of GME and AMC? Yeah, so I think that, I, I've, been, I've been tracking this very closely, right? So I think what happened there was that the communication could have been done better. So the reason why they stop uh, the purchase of GME or other stocks is not because they were manipulating the market, but it's because in, in our line of work, there is a collateral requirement that you need to have in your bank uh, in order to continue operations. So think about it like a bank. Uh, a bank also has collateral requirements. You got to put upfront a certain amount of money with regulators. 
so that the regulators know that if anything happens, you're going to back everybody's money and, and cover it, right? So what had happened in Robinhood's case is that there was this huge spike in volume and interest on their platform because of the GME craze and, and other uh, uh, short squeeze stocks, right? That the volume went so high that overnight they needed to increase their collateral requirements and they didn't have the money to do that. And so they needed to temporarily suspend certain stocks. And then they unsuspended the very next day, but, but it was not communicated properly. But actually, if you take a step back, what's happening there is it's a cultural revolution. What's basically happening is that all of a sudden in the US, access to capital market is so easy that the mass population can have their voice heard over these large financial institutions that have been there for hundreds of years. That is what I call the true democratization of finance through capital markets. And I wouldn't be surprised if such a phenomenon happens in the next few months in other regions of the world as well, where all of a sudden the collective consciousness of you know, the public realizes, hey, you know, our voice can also be heard um, in, in some of these things. And it's not always gonna be the big financial institutions that's controlling the prices or controlling the market. So I feel like that's a very interesting development and I wouldn't be surprised if it happens in other parts of the world in the coming months. All right, oh wow. It seems like we have a lot of questions for you, um, but because of the time, I think this might be the last one. Um, so from, there's another question from Reynaldo. So he's curious to learn the process of Ajay went through to find product market fit. What tips would you give for future business leaders starting their own startup and what they can do to find product market fit? Yeah, and if you guys still have questions, just send me a LinkedIn message, I'll answer them. Uh, so this is a very good question for people who are not aware product market fit is kind of a industry term to say that you have a great product and you have the right market and you've met the needs of that market. And therefore, that's what you call product market fit. And it's typically kind of this holy grail aha moment for entrepreneurs that starts, you know, the entrepreneur starts realizing, ah, I actually do have something. It's not just a toy, it's not just a passion. There is a market for what I'm doing and it can be valuable to a lot of people, right? So the path to product market fit, I actually think that there's like two parts to this that a lot of people confuse on. I think the first part to this is creating is proving that your product actually has value and the second part of this is proving that there's actually a market for this that's why it's called product market fit there's two components to this and on the product side like you just gotta really have conviction that your product is really great and the best way to do it is to starve your product from any advertising like do not spend anything at all on ads instagram facebook nothing no ads at all that is the true test of your product market fit if you can still grow exponentially in an environment that you don't spend any money on ads, then you know that people are coming to you because of your product. So, and, and that's very difficult for a lot of people to listen to and a lot of people disagree with me on this. Now, once you prove out the value of your product, the second part is proving out that there's a market for it. And that's why I say growth, right? This is where you do start turning on some of the other traditional marketing channels in order to prove out that there's more than a hundred or more than a hundred thousand people that want a product, there's like millions or tens of millions of people, right? So this is where you wanna turn on your traditional um, channels and make sure that you can grow to the next 10 million, 100 million people while controlling your, uh, while controlling your finances. That's kind of the trick. All right. Um, thank you so much for your time, Anderson. We really, 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 really appreciate it. Um, I'm sure we all gain knowledge and valuable lessons today. So yeah, that's it from me. Maybe our director wants to say a few words before um, ending this webinar. So Arvian. thank you very much, guys. Yep. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Anderson and Steven. I mean, you guys have taught us many things today, um, how to be resilient and how to be, I mean, like not giving up and just find our conviction on like how we're gonna uh, start our uh, venture as an entrepreneur in the future. I think it's really reassuring, re reaffirming. And I just want to close this off by thanking all of you guys who have um, 
who have been participating in this uh, streaming and in, in the stream and who have asked many questions today. Um, I believe those questions also guided the discussion really well. Um, all the answers provided by our speakers are really relevant to our experience and um, really on point actually, like it really uh, touches into like the main pain points that especially me as a aspiring entrepreneur in the future uh, is feeling right now. So yeah, uh, thank you all for coming to this event and yeah, stay tuned for our next um, episode of the entrepreneurship series and our next events. And yeah, see ya.